Uh, welcome everyone to our, our session today. Um, the title of our, our leadership session, our thought leadership session today is, is Climate Resilience, the Impossible Challenge with a question mark. Uh, this session uh, will explore the findings of the 2020 DEFRA report, Systems Analysis for Water Resources, and will also provide some examples of systems thinking approach. Highlighting methods to allow us to map out linkages and how to use these to analyze impacts on decisions and strategies on a systems approach. So our panel today consists of uh, representatives from Mark McDonald's. Uh, first off, we have um, Brendan Bromage, who is our principal civil engineer working within our water consultancy division. Um, and, is, and Brendan is currently um, supporting DEFRA with the production of the 2020 systems analysis water resources report and is also contributing to the LTIS framework with the Environment Agency, that's the long-term investment scenarios. Brendan also leads the resilience work stream for Water Resources Southeast, which we'll be talking about a bit later. We've also got Fiona Barber with us today, um, who is our global practice leader for water resources and flooding, and has been a bit of a global ambassador for catchment management. Uh, we also have Martin Williamson, who many of you may know. He's a uh, account leader within our advisory program delivery unit and is currently working alongside various clients, including the Environment Agency. And finally, uh, myself, uh, my name is Mark Plowman. I'm the key account lead for the Environment Agency, and I'll also be facilitating this event today. So just to give you a bit of a flavor of uh, what we're going to be, the, the order of the day, uh, Brendan is going to start with a brief presentation um, on system syncing approach and how it applies to various things, including the DEFRA and the planning of water resources, uh, the resilience framework within Water Resources Southeast, and also we'll be touching on uh, the advantages of taking a systems uh, thinking approach. After the presentation, uh, Fiona will sp uh, spend a few minutes just providing her thoughts on the water sector, including how a system of sinking approach can be used to focus on things like drought and flooding. After Fiona, uh, Martin Willison will be providing his thoughts on system sinking and how it can be applied sort of cross sector, not just within the water uh, sector. He will touch on direct examples of system sinking and how they've already been used to develop things like the ecosystem services tool. And finally, uh, well, not finally, if we've got a bit of time, I'll also provide some thoughts on, you know, what sort of organizational challenges exist when you sort of apply a system syncing approach to projects. And Brendan will also you know, jump in if he can and provide some, some thoughts on government governance arrangements on, on projects that adopt the system syncing approach. So that's the order of the day. And we, we, we hope you enjoy the presentation. But um, but finally, today is all about using the opportunity that we have today to prompt discussions around system syncing. Uh, we don't claim to have all the answers. It's a, it's a really big subject and there's lots of complex problems to overcome. So you know, we really want to hear your thoughts and we're going to have a Q&A session at the end, around about 15, 20 minutes. So please feel free to, uh, to put in Put in your comments or your, your, your questions and together we'll have a, a broad discussion on it. Uh, we, we sort of had a run through of this uh, yesterday and it was amazing how many questions that uh, we get we, we, we sort of posed to ourselves and tried to answer them so we're hoping that will be the, the key part of today. So um, if I can I'll now hand over to Brendan who, uh, who will uh, uh, just give us a, a brief presentation on sis, uh, uh, systems thinking. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, thanks, everyone. Thanks for um, pitching up uh, and in engaging with this debate. I'll share my screen. Apologies. I think I've got the, the air conditioner in the background might be, um, be causing difficulties. Um, but I'll do my best. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, systems approaches at catchment and regional water resources level. We see climate as one of a number of concurrent um, challenges and can't be addressed in isolation of ongoing kind of operational development or biodiversity challenges or kind of 
economic growth and so on. So that's why we kind of locate the climate, locating the climate stay in particular in, in, the, in the systems, um, uh, in the systems thinking space. I'm going to look at two case studies. I'm going to look at the, the DEFRA systems analysis for water resources report. And then I'm going to talk a bit about how we've applied that for the water resources southeast resilience framework, which is a regional multi-sector plan focusing on drought, but also addressing operational resilience issues. And then I've got a, a slide just to kind of summarize some of the advantages of taking a, a systems perspective. So to First of all, just to, to kind of introduce the um, the report we wrote for DEFRA, um, we looked at two uh, catchments, uh, the Eden in Cumbria and the Medway in Kent and Sussex. Um, so two different catchments, one more rural and one with a, an interesting interface between the urban and the rural um, aspects. And the idea was to, to take a systems mapping approach uh, apply it at the catchment level and, and develop proof of concept. So to do it, to learn the lessons and then kind of say how we should, it should be, could be taken forward in future on the basis of people not making the same mistakes as us, but also kind of building on what, what went right with the work that, that we did. Um, and so the analysis was very interesting in, in taking this participatory approach because in like I say, it was different in both places. In Cumbria, there was, in the Eden, there was a lot of analysis around the role of farmers in the catchment. And you're dealing with hard systems and soft systems in terms of what influences farmer behavioral change. In addition to a lot of work in the Eden on uh, ecosystem services and the natural capital. And then in, in, in Kent, we had a very interesting uh, contrast between a more kind of industrial development pathway or, I mean, the area's got a lot of fruit farming as well, and just looking at the interplay between the two development pathways of those. So it was a rich experience and um, uh, a lot of insight gained from the approach. The key learning overall is that, you know, we've got a, pro a, a process that could be taken up elsewhere and adapted. We looked at hard and soft systems, we, we bridged that. And then also we had a very interesting kind of theme running through it about the interface between, um, well, like I say, the hard and soft systems and the different systems cultures and the relevance to systems operations. So you've got engineering systems, but then you've got environmental and social systems. And, and we, we looked a lot at those issues about those interfaces. Then we uh, took, took work up with Water Resources Southeast. So Water Resources Southeast is a major investment planning exercise. There's 1,400 um, interventions have been identified by the six water companies in the area and other multi-sector groups um, covering catchment options, engineering options, demand management options. And the systemic basis of this work has this idea of the environmental system, uh, a social and economic system, a non-public water supply system or multi-sector system, a public water supply system, and they're all interrelated. This was what was presented in, our, in the draft uh, framework, but there was a bit of feedback which, which, which came back in terms of the need to be more, um, to go to, into more detail on what we meant by these systems and to make sure that the environmental system was seen as underpinning all of these other systems. So we took this systems mapping approach and, and you can see on the table there, the different systems, uh, subsystems that we looked at. So in the multi-sector, it was power, paper, quarries, canals, golf. Um, and then also, you know, you can see at the bottom in the environmental, the land use, river health and flooding, the agriculture straddled, straddled the two. So a lot of detail went into the mapping um, this is the public water supply system. And so this is one of, I think, 13 different yeah. systems we looked at, just very briefly to kind of introduce it. I don't know, can you see my cursor? Um, on, on the left in blue, we've got uh, a competent water company and they produce uh, engineering, resilient engineering operation, infrastructure and water resource. And this leads to a supply demand balance over here. And on the right side, you've got customer, good customer relations, customer engagement in drought management, and in order to get that balance. Now, if this all goes well, 
you get the confidence of the regulator up at the top of the page, who then allow a more innovative strategy and you get a positive feedback loop. And that's how the system works in terms of its regulation, its impact. And then the yellow cells are, are um, some of the social and economic benefits from that. This was our starter map. Then over the course of the project, as we looked in more detail about what the resilience framework, what we were actually measuring, the this part of the system map turned into the map on the right. You can see the green nodes are environmental nodes, orange and red are shocks and stresses, and then there are little blue blobs, which are the metrics themselves. So what happened as a result of this process was that we revised where those blue blobs were, i.e. we changed the metrics and included more complex issues such as the metric over on the customer services because good customer relations makes a water supply system more resilient and therefore that came in as into the investment strategy that if you're developing your customer relations, customers will be more engaged in, in drought management and your system, will, you'll be able to manage that supply demand balance better over the long term. So that's how we integrated soft elements and hard elements into the investment planning. It's the investment modeling is being done at the moment. Other things that came in at that time would be was soil health, because you know we, we demonstrated how soil health is beneficial to the resilience of the water sector in, in, its, in, in its breadth, and also uh, environmental land management, because over the long term, if uh, in land, participatory environmental land management, collaborative land management is undertaken, then you will get uh, the, the land will be managed for the benefit of everyone. And that enhances resilience of the system. So there's a concrete example of how a systems approach has led to an investment strategy. And that's kind of moving forward to implementation now. So just to summarize then, some of the benefits of taking a, uh, uh, a systems-based approach um, it really helps with problem analysis. Um, uh, you can you can define clearly and collectively what what the problem is and what things is uh, what's linked up to what basically. You can look at shocks and stresses. You can or adaptation. You can look at how the system is going to change for various reasons. You can identify options. You know, as we did with with soil health or or or, or customer um, relations. You can say, oh, yeah, look, this is part of the system that needs beefing up, there needs to be some action here, or needs restraining. Um, uh, so you identify options. And then, you know, systems mapping doesn't replace conventional analysis, but it shows where you need to do that conventional analysis in order to develop the rigor for the, for the, for the interventions that you've got. It helps you uh, then develop those uh, solutions collectively. So you can develop blended finance on the basis of looking at multiple interventions into a system and attributing benefits according to those different interventions. So that, that kind of um, the whole is greater than some of the parts. Well, you can actually kind of map that out. Like I said, identify metrics uh, and validate those metrics. So also we looked at the 25 year environmental plan metrics when we on, on this systems map. And what's really important here. Um, these two kind of factors on the, on the right is you've developed an audit trail for the complex conversations that you've had. So the way that map that I showed you for WRC changed from the first map at the first meeting over the course of a two month project to the final map. And that's just one of 13 maps that was, was being developed. It's the one that developed most. Well, we can show at the end of the day why we've come up with the decisions we've had and that audit trail is quite significant. It also can be used later, can be built on in the future. And once you've done that with the right people in the room and you've, for example, you know, we develop the, the agricultural maps with, with the agricultural community, then people have really bought in because they can see their voice in the system that's been developed. So those are some of the benefits um, of, of a, uh, a systems-based approach. Um, I think I'm handing over to Fiona now. Thanks. Thank you, Brendan. That was a, a great overview. And uh, the, I hear about um, these kind of new developments in the water resources space for systems thinking. It makes me reflect, could this system work within the flooding space in, in our water cycle? And my instant reaction was that um, we are already embedding quite a lot of 
other benefits when we're looking at flood schemes into our decision making. But what I'm now coming around to think about is actually why are we still separating out our water resources and our flooding projects as separate analysis? Now, there is a logic there that the challenges are very seasonally different. Uh, the analysis of the data is very separate because we look at extremes in either end. But I'm kind of coming around to the idea that we shouldn't be working in these in these silos within the water space. And I think mapping out the whole water system, understanding how the the um, catchment response in a flood time and in a drought time are interlinked with soil health at both ends and and additionally the overarching challenge of looking at the water quality where we might have different challenges during flood scenarios where the CSOs are spilling to maybe drought scenarios where your rural runoff might be having more of an impact um, on, on low flows and looking at how to increase our water quality should be done holistically. So why not we look at the catchment management as a whole and see if we can map together all the systems that are, that are driving a catchment response throughout the year and through extremes of, of rainfall and extremes of drought, um, if we could better understand how these all connect together, surely we can provide something better that might not be just meeting one driver. We might be looking at, at our water supply drivers and our flooding drivers as one. And I think as we have realized that climate change is adding that extra layer of complexity because all of these factors that are linked together, the, the links and how they actually develop and change in the future are different we're going to get longer periods of drought and also more intense rainfall. So we have to start really looking at this complexity, removing the simplicity that we have relied upon in the past and try and look at this so that we can appreciate how the future challenges are going to change. Um, and I also feel that we've got that into that space with being able to manage big data and for us to be able to rise to that challenge of, of actually considering these complexities in the whole it's not beyond us it's not we don't need that simplification in our analysis anymore so maybe we could try and map the whole water system together in one approach so we understand the linkages um, not just within a flood sphere but throughout the year then perhaps we can bring to this um, more radical solutions and um, things that maybe serve a purpose you can put in um, flood solutions, maybe more storage, that actually also increases aquifer recharge that will help during the drier periods. And, and looking at these as a whole, we'll surely realise better opportunities and more opportunities that um, will help us work together. So that's really what I was reflecting when thinking about this in the context of the water sector. And I think I'll hand over to Martin to take it maybe further. Thank you, Fiona. Um, yeah, so uh, system thinking for me um, allows me to sort of make connections that um, maybe you wouldn't naturally make. Uh, so sort of considering um, things like the energy transition, you may look at uh, just sort of hydro and uh, pump storage being those sort of solutions that uh, water is providing. Uh, but sort of a, a little known one is the sort of power from sub thermal uh, capabilities of water being exploited. Uh, so extracting the latent heat. And you sort of couple that with the government's push to get all households off gas. Um, so all those new developments now sort of looking for alternative methods uh, to power those homes uh, and the use of um, things like um, ground source heat pumps. So actually integrating our SUDS work, which they're, they're mandated to do anyway, um, to actually extract that energy, uh, couple it with a, a site-wide energy um, plan um, just makes sense. But until you actually stand back and look at the system at play there on those uh, building developments and all the constituent parts, you won't make those connections. I think the, the other one sort of that sort of I, I sort of worry about is look, looking at the uh, sort of cladding crisis at the moment and the position people are being put in. Um, you know, but those buildings are there and we're just going to be replacing like for like, but obviously fire retardant. But um, Actually, if we looked at vertical greening, you know, what could that do in the flood space? What could that do to our um, inner city spaces, um, bringing back some uh, sort of well-being and uh, placemaking? Um, so some of these opportunities pop up when you're looking at those systems that are in play. Um, and uh, you know, why can't we you know, fund some of that uh, out of uh, our flood risk budgets? 
uh, and draw in some of the more um, sort of greener elements into those. And look, you're sort of transport in our uh, in our cities, the drainage networks are you know, overwhelmed uh, by quite you know, nominal storms at times. It doesn't cause a lot of damage, but it causes a lot of disruption. So um, you know, we're already embedding um, technology into the uh, drainage covers, so we can actually tell when a, a gully pot needs emptying. It's not a big step to be able to flip that to look at the um, catchments filling up. Um, where the road network's actually going to start to become uh, overwhelmed and link that to our smart um, uh, traffic systems and redirect flows around it. So as we look at systems at, at work and where water touches it, and it pretty much touches everything uh, on the planet, um, we can make a connection. And that for me is uh, where systems thinking really, really helps. Um, and just looking back, really, uh, you mentioned ecosystem services. Probably 10 years ago, I, I really liked that, and I liked uh, lots of concepts around uh, sort of beneficiary pays and those type of elements with it. Uh, but it made me, as an engineer, step back and look at the broader picture and be able to connect, um, you know, socioeconomics to my flourish work, uh, environmental work, um, tourism. All those bits were, were in there, and it just got that broader thinking and. Um, you know, as engineers and uh, people that develop um, schemes and, you know, missing opportunities is criminal. So not looking um, is, is a mistake lots of us make. But yes, that's uh, that's my take on it. Uh, Mark, back to you. Okay, thank you. That, that really good comments. And yeah, the, the whole system thinking approach is, is clearly a bit of a no brainer. But what I'm um, thinking in my head is, is how do you actually turn that into reality? And uh, when it comes to project delivery, and key to that, um, and I think probably needs looking at in, in more detail, using examples from across the world, is how you actually look at organizational um, setups and the challenges of governance on, on projects. Uh, it's it, A lot of the projects we do, whether it be flood risk or water, there's multiple partners, there's multiple benefits. Um, but those benefits you know, are not equally shared. So how do you actually pull together a governance structure that allows the, the, the benefits and the outcomes that you've, you've described in, in sort of the early strategy state, how do you actually turn that into the delivery of a project? And there, there are examples out there of hybrid governance models, which, you know, things like High Speed 2 use and, and, and others. But I think there needs to be a lot more uh, focus and, and um, examples looked at in terms of efficient governance processes and how organizations, you know, Clearly, the, a, a big challenge of a systems approach is it could be spanning multiple local authorities, for instance, multiple regions of the environment agency, multiple um, you know, individuals that, that are gaining benefits, but not necessarily are, are, are leading the project. So coming up with a governance structure which can be proved and understood that allows the efficient delivery of the project is probably one of the biggest challenges. And I think yeah, you know, over over the course of the years, managing some 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 projects from large ones to small ones, there's probably a little more that needs to be done on things like the management case in 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 a in a business case. You know, really looking at instead of just adopting the the old methods of you know you might use a Prince two model, you might use a hybrid model, you might use an, a a model that a partnership model, but really, do they work? And, and really, um, how how do we actually get the the learning out of these these big projects? And obviously, Brendan's talked about um, the, the the strategy that he's working on, water resources southeast. That could be a really good example. You know, it's early stage, but at some point, that's gonna that's gonna flow into some some projects and some delivery. How we get the learning between the strategy and what was meant to happen versus the delivery will be absolutely key. And, and I know um, things like the UK government uh, construction industry, as well as uh, IPA, are really keen on looking at roles and responsibilities within, within projects, within the governance structure, making sure you've got the right people that can collaborate with all the different partners and stakeholders. And also governance is about making sure the investment is going in the right place and you're keeping an eye on expenditure program and all the rest of it. Well, that becomes quite complex when you've got different drivers across across large geographical areas. So how are we actually, you know, things like aligning FSOD and financial scheme of delegations so that everyone is happy is probably the next evolution. And, and like I said, I haven't got all the answers and this is what this, this forum is about. 
But I think you know, that, that's where I come from, from it. You know, it's the practical, how do we deliver this? And we've got the theory, it makes sense, it's a no brainer. How do we now turn that into actually delivery? That's all I was gonna say on that really. I think, um, Brendan, I, I don't know if you've, you've picked up any of that sort of later thinking about governance and models that might be used. You're on mute, Brendan. There you go. Sorry. Um, thanks. Yeah, I think this this question of governance is really key. Um, uh, fundamentally, there's no silver bullet, and knowing there's no silver bullet is actually a very good way of avoiding a whole load of problems. Um, there's some quite interesting systems theory which can be unpacked and applied here, and really helps I found in, 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 in tackling this. One is this question of wicked problems and tame problems. So problems come into two categories. A tame problem is a problem such as an engineering operation, which is, which is basically one that we can find an answer to because we can define the problem and we can say, well, this is the problem, these are the parameters, these are the variables, and we can manage it. A wicked problem is more complex than that. You know, for example, how do you manage catchment or in other parts of uh, society, you know, obesity or knife crime or something like that, where actually, you know, government has been looking for, for kind of policies, but how you articulate the problem is part of solving the problem and people are going to come at this from, from, from different aspects and systems thinking has been applied. Um, so there's some very interesting case studies in the knife crime and the um, and the obesity issues or rather use the same systems mapping approaches in order to get multiple approaches to a problem because you can't actually nail down what the problem is that you're, you're, you're tackling. So that's that's one start to this. Another um, element of this is a piece of theory called cultural theory, which basically works on the assumption that different organizations will have different cultures towards risk management and different assumptions about um, uh, how, how to control systems and will therefore tackle that their problem. They'll see the problem in a particular way and they will uh, tackle it from this approach, whereas actually what we want is these multiple approaches. So for example, I mean, you can simplify this. Um, uh, Tony Allen, who came up with the, the term virtual water, he, he said, um, he's recently passed away. Uh, he, he, he said, good governance is when .com, .gov and .org work well together for the benefit of the society. And he was capturing that because a .gov or a, 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 a government or also an engineering SO approach to a system is to, is to control the problem, to define the problem and to control it. That's what we as engineers are good at. Whereas a .org or a third sector approach is really about mobilizing collective action. And there's elements of problems which are really best handled with that. But then .com approach is looking for opportunities to, to come in and solve problems and you know, make, make a profit, but they do the heavy lifting. So if you look at those three different elements of governance, of interventions to a system, well, actually they will be best fixed best able to kind of tackle any part of one of these problems, you, you really get the benefit when you get an interplay between them. So if you look at catchments, the Water Framework Directive was very much a, a, a dot gov. It was, it was defining the problem and looking at interventions to control it, but it didn't solve the problem of the loss of biodiversity and decline of catchments in itself. So what's come in is CABA which is a, a more creative, more organic, fluid approach, which tackles some of the soft system issues as well as, you know, some of the hard ones. But then on the other hand, it hasn't got the, the muscle of the private sector. It can't come in at, 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 at you know, a very large scale where you would um, uh, kind of be able to do things much larger in, in, in terms of the private sector intervention. So, but actually what you need is an interplay of all of these and it's quite interesting then to see how, you know, when we tackle the question of governance of these complex systems, if we tackle it from just one of those and say, look, this is, this is what, what we need to do, then you'll, you, there's a risk that you're kind of leaving out some of these other areas. Whereas if there's a constant interplay between these, I mean, this is the, the theory behind wicked problems, is you need this interplay in order to find a way forward on these. And, and I think that helps kind of unlock some of this. Um, 
I mean, just to give a final example, if you, if you look at uh, kind of three different actors in, at, in the flooding and, and catchment space, on the one hand, uh, end of the spectrum, you've got a catchment partnership who are the most organic, most able to kind of widespread connection, bring up grassroots action and really contribute something that other, other groups aren't able to do. At the other end of the spectrum, you could, you'd have kind of say the, the environment agency's asset, asset management team who are able to kind of come in and do the large scale engineering projects in, in a, working with you know, private contractors and, and, and so on and, and an engineering kind of body and they're able to do something different. But what's very interesting is if you look at the flood partnership who are a little bit hybrid between the two who marry up the uh, environment agencies kind of muscle in terms of kind of giving direction, but yet have a, a partnership element as well. So I think, you know, just kind of using these categories is very helpful in, in working out how are we going to manage uh, the complex, a complex system? What type of system are we looking at? What is the response that's going to be able to move things forward in this, in this way? Yeah, I sort of agree. And we've got we've got to I'll just check the Q&A and we've got we've got a question which is about what changes in regulation, governance structures, legislation are needed to get out of the silo. So we're sort of in a way talking about that. For, for me, the, the governance side of things you know, is is that partnership approach. Um, but not just saying it, actually having the leadership within it, people being OK about, you know, possibly losing a bit of control, but for, for the wider benefit and setting up those partnership governance arrangement whether it be a stakeholder boards or project boards with with sponsorship which is which is which is the right roles and responsibilities and and, and takes that sort of unilateral approach is, is probably where we need to end up it requires trust and that's the big thing uh, trusting that you know ultimately the benefits will be will be delivered and there will be um <clears throat> there'll be bumps along the road but uh, applying things like that you know we, we're quite common the use of change control within within contracts. There's also uh, a growing body of evidence which is talking about change control within organisations. So you know you you have an organisation that might have a certain um, onus on, on de uh, delivering X, Y, and Z, but you know they will have to change, and the organisational structures within those those organisations which are delivering big projects with multiple benefits also has to change, and also has to have a, an element of change management within it. And that's probably the hard bit because change is always difficult. But having the ability to recognise it and, and and change organisations at the same time is probably key to sort of the delivery of these multiple benefits. Well, one challenge I would just like to put to you in in terms of and, and I agree, partnership working is the way forward. But I see one of the barriers that becomes quite impossible is that different organisations have not only have different drivers but different legislative remits you look at a water company and they have um in legislation a restriction on what water they can take and what uh standard protection that they provide a service to and, and all of that boundaries that they have to work within and they're regulated in a way that um their hands are tied when sometimes trying to work in the partnership to offer something that stretches their ability beyond what their, their remit is. And I think these legislative barriers at the moment, I feel, are stopping releasing the, the greatest benefit. But I think with these partnerships working, we have to recognise that, yes, we want to be all things to all people, but it, there's a space for compromise. And I think, you know, the recognition that maybe there's a greatest need for one particular driver over another and let's see how much we can achieve in the secondary driver is maybe a space we can expand a bit more on um but i do think that um companies with all the will in the world do have restrictions and one interesting reflection i've heard of recently is is perhaps and especially if you're looking outside the water space we've got a lot of funding mechanisms that allows us to fund a flood project or a transport project. But if we're trying to fund a project that maybe do, does both, 
it's really hard because the processes and the drivers and the way to access that money has to be predominantly led by one of those sectors. Um, and a space that maybe has a bit more freedom to look beyond those restraints is maybe, a, uh, well, I'm kind of thinking more in the city space where all of these things are maybe intensified. Um, a city with a mayoral system might have that leadership and that ability to think across different uh, drivers and, and perhaps have the authority to take it outside the space that they're currently working in and restrained by legislation. And that's an interesting model for some of these challenges within a city space, but that doesn't always address the sort of catchment wide and some of these larger regional models that we need to, to address these problems in. I think, that's, I think that's really helpful, Fiona, in terms of, because you've got a combination of, of that leadership, but also, you know, enabling an organic response. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, one of the things about the Manchester Natural Capital Investment Plan is, you know, the diversity of people engaging for all, there's an overarching kind of, kind of structure. And it's interesting to see what United Utilities are doing here. I think they've just recently um, put forward a, a major fund as part of their uh, catchment uh, systems thinking um, uh, cast program um, which invites people to come up with ideas and put something in and thereby they are doing both they're providing a lead but yet also kind of harnessing the power of a, a, a kind of more more plural uh, a broader uh, a broader approach and then you know this then leads on to the question in terms of well what level is is, is it best to coordinate these things at? Because, you know, on the one hand, you know, if you're taking a broader natural capital approach, well, you know, we see in Manchester the kind of significance of local government in that. Um, but also interesting to kind of see a catchment level or regional level. So one of the interesting contrasts between um, the work we did in the Medway and we do work we did for Water Resources Southeast was when we were working in the Medway, the Catchment Partnership and various other kind of stakeholders there, then we had much more granularity, but we didn't have some of the big hitters who were kind of not interested in working at the catchment level in contrast to working at the regional level. So when we worked at the regional level, we had kind of the major paper mills and, you know, the power sector and so on were at the table. And, and I think given... The fact that there's no single one problem we're trying to address, but we've got multiple overlapping problems of water resources, of biodiversity and, 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 and natural capital and social capital and so on, then inevitably there's going to be a plurality of these different levels where different things are, uh, are run at. And I think kind of, well, I think the two things, you know, we've been to the thing, the, the, the techniques we've been looking at here are really relevant. In terms of systems mapping, if you want to kind of develop a blended finance approach, then it's really helpful to have a collective approach to systems mapping, because then you can say, well, look, these are the different levels of intervention, and these are the benefits they create. Who is interested in funding any one part of this, and what attribution of that benefit you get? So in terms of convening multiple benefit schemes, systems mapping really has an important role to, role to play. Do you think systems mapping has an important role to play in understanding whether the problem is best tackled at a catchment level or a regional level? Would you even use it as early to decide which way to go with, with that? Um, so I think would the mapping help. be done at different scales depending on where you're starting I, I, from? I think it'd be done at different scales. Yeah. You know, I, I find in terms of answering that problem, I, I do think that the, the cultural theory approach, you know, this who has the comparative advantage and at what scale is a really significant question. I mean, you know, in, in terms of the CABA groups, catchment partnerships and so on, you know, in terms of mobilising a breadth of, of, of actor to make a difference on the ground, they're fantastic. Um, but, you know, that's not going to be bringing in the some of the questions, of, you know, you look at strategic level around you know, the development of hydrogen, where the major water resource is, and so on. Well, that needs to be done at a, at a, uh, at a, on a different scale, in a different way. Um, so interesting to see that if we keep in mind the plurality here, then, then I think we can be more nuanced in kind of saying, well, you know, there isn't a single answer to this, but we, we've, we've got a, 
uh, draw on the creativity of each of these types of, of intervention. I think the industry sometimes wants to be told how to go about things and what's the process and let's just <laughs> do, go through the same thing over and over again and I think the recognition that there is no one answer there's no one solution it's lots of different problems that need lots of different ways of approaching it sometimes does cause a bit of a challenge to um, people who like a function and system and a, and almost a fairness and a transparency because if you're a big organization, say the Environment Agency, they can spend money lots of different ways. But how can they provide that overarching view of this is the best, this is better for this catchment, this is better for this catchment, if they're following two different processes or two different scales? I can imagine that throws a lot of challenge up to an organization to, to allow that flexibility for what's best. But, uh, but I can see the resistance there. I think um, here again, um, wicked problem theory. I mean, do, yeah. do, do look up wicked problem theory. It's fascinating and, uh, I mean, really insightful um, because one of the things it states is that people articulate a problem in the way that they can perceive intervening. It, it kind of we articulate a problem in a way that legitimizes our, our perceived intervention. So therefore, as engineers, we have a, a, a natural um, tendency to perceive uh, natural resource problems in ways which favour an engineering solution, whereas an environmental NGO would have a natural tendency to perceive the, uh, the um, uh, nat natural resource problems in a way that a collective response, we can get people together and change the world. And, you know, this is, you know, Greta Thunberg is, is a great example of this. I mean, what she does is absolutely fantastic, but it's very different what the World Economic Forum do is very different from what the UN does. And actually, there's, I mean, it's a complex interplay between those, is being mindful that actually we all have our, our biases towards the way that we would like to intervene. And then when we can move to a point, I mean, this is how we're moving, this is real systems thinking, is that it involves that cultural shift to realizing that other systems operate with different cultures and different, different value structures and contribute something that I can't see. And, um, you know, when that, that is a kind of maturity of systems thinking to, to bring about that collective learning with, with different organisational cultures cult contributing and, and coming up with perspectives that, you know, as, as, as an individual operator, it's un, uh, impossible to kind of come up with. And then we're really moving, he making headway in terms of systems thinking. So I, we all have to listen more. It's all I was going to reflect back to that. <laughs> I was just going to pick up on uh, a question that's come in uh, from Terry Fuller on the, um, the organisational alignment they require based around the outcomes. Um, so I think the system thinking allows us to do that mapping and interconnectivity between organisations and bringing out the benefits or disbenefits that each one of those uh, organisations might you know, have. You know, we, balancing water supply versus flood risk. You know, sometimes you want to get rid of the water as fast as you want out of your catchment. Sometimes you want to retain it as long as possible. There's uh, competing um, needs there. Uh, but the systems thinking bit allows us to make those connections that may not be obvious. Um, and then draw in those organizations for conversations and contributions. So uh, you're right, I think if we can actually show how they all align, how they could all get benefit from any individual solution, or you know, we can then get all the right parties around the table and you know, smooth the, the process. Um, it's when you leave people out that they, uh, they push back hardest and delay things longest. So, uh, and I think it's an interesting point there, sort of starting with the outcome, I think Terry's alluding to, and then looking at all the possible things that feed that outcome as maybe your, your link your linchpin or whatever to who to bring to the table and how to explore all the possible organizations that could bring work towards that one outcome is if you you start with the outcome and then do your system out from there if you know what I mean that makes sense to me yeah you're right you could, you could specify your system that, uh, that creates that outcome right mm -hmm. thanks uh, apologies Sarah Terry I hadn't seen the question where the Q&A's were on the screen so um I've seen that I I think this is really great in terms of the, how, how we're thinking about who needs to be at the table. 
But then if we marry that up with the systems mapping, what we found in the, um, and we've written this up in the DEFRA report, is the need for the people who are at the table to be engaged with their constituencies, to have broader outreach, um, and to do the mapping at a, at a, in a time frame that allows for those broader consultations rather than having everyone in the room, which is obviously a lot more difficult online now, now anyway. Um, because if we then kind of get this organic approach to engaging people right, and we've got it, you know, the stages of development with the systems mapping approach, I mean, it is just one tool of many. Um, but then, you, like I say, you've created an audit trail of something, a really complex process of engagement and buy-in and so on. And I, I think kind of marrying that up of, of that wider organisational and constituency engagement with the, with the getting it down on, on paper, uh, kind of follow, which you can follow then up, follow up by, by using, I mean, we've got an in-house app uh, for, for um, interrogating the systems map and looking at complex linkages once you've done it. So I think it, it's, it's a matter of ma marrying up that kind of analytical approach and the audit trail with the, the broader uh, stakeholder engagement that Terry, Terry mentions. And, and there are actually some some great examples around around the world which are similar to this because you know we're, we're talking about maybe a region within the uk or, or that sort of scale but you know there are examples around the world for instance the red sea dead sea project i don't know if you've ever looked at that that is that the benefits there are you're trying to look at the red sea as a region which obviously spans countries including israel uh, saudi arabia jordan egypt yeah, and, and they're coming together in, in this approach. And you can imagine how difficult that is politically. And if they can achieve these sort of things, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure we can apply that sort of thinking here as well. Um, and the benefits there are not just, you know, from a sort of water uh, position or basis, but also tourism, investment into the area, um, increased travel routes and all the rest of it, as well as huge environmental benefits of doing things like, you know, m maintaining the Dead Sea and, and the Red Sea. So I'm sure it can be done. It's just a, it's a bit like what Fiona sa said. It's, it's about people just want to want to be told how to do it. And that's probably where we need to we need to get to to try and actually get to a point of mapping this out, understanding it and then putting putting a model behind it. I think, I think what's quite interesting is, sorry, yeah, go on. Um, um, is how other sectors are now reaching out. So from the finance sector, there's the uh, Task Force for Climate-Related uh, Financial Disclosure. Is basically the um, finance and, and business world is looking for, you know, people in the environmental sector who are thinking more holistically. And there's the, now the new Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosure is one. Um, but then also, if you look at the six capitals, the multi-capital uh, framework, that is a systems-based method. And it gives us a, a common language which runs through, um, you know, when we apply it to, a, to engineering and environmental problems, and it can be applied, you know, it speaks the language of business. Well, then that's a way of connecting it. So it's reflecting other people's um, language. But one thing I, I was uh, reading yesterday online um, I find very humbling to, to kind of think, well, it, it's just about talking to people. Is um, I didn't know about the Scamander Dam on the M62, which, um, so in the 1960s, um, the Ministry of Transport was talking with the Huddersfield, uh, I think it's the Water Corporation, and there's a, a significant stretch of the M62 is, is a dam, which is the basis of the water supply for Huddersfield. So kind of think in the 1960s, you know, they were able to get a massive uh, co-benefit, which meant that both projects, you know, were much more financially viable. And so it's really about driving down costs if you get these synergies, these systemic synergies. And they, they managed it with, with the dam when they were building the M62. So we've got to find their own way of doing it in our generation. And do you think we can? I mean, what we've pointed out today is the complexity of it the flexibility we need, different models, different scales. It does feel big and a big challenge. And do you think we'll get there? So I think it's, it's essential. I mean, if you look, but we've got new frameworks coming through all the while. Um, you know, the 25 year environmental plan is fantastic because it just provides that framework that we can all rally around and speak the same language. Um, and so, and then I, I think, 
you know, some of the work being done on, um, you know, at the regional level, both on flooding and on water resources, you know, when you make a new reservoir, you need to have an area, if you need to kind of draw it down quickly, you need kind of washlands and so on. Well, you, you, you know, who, who else needs washlands? Well, some of the biodiversity agenda and so on. You know, there's a number of ways that we can link things up, or for example, using more technology. Um, you know, if you uh, have a, a reservoir and you have it full, it's no use for flood control. But if we've got enough technology that you want to kind of draw some of that down ahead of a storm, well, then you flatten the curve by letting stuff out earlier and then you can store water behind it. So I think just again and again, and, and we saw this in, in, the, in the new piece out from Offwat yesterday, innovation, innovation, innovation. We've just got to keep kind of plugging ahead with, with ideas. And I think the more, um, what brings to mind when you mention that dam thing is the smart canals in Glasgow, where they do that. They, they get, they lower the canal system ahead of any rainfall event. And then the more of the urban drainage is discharging to it. And I think the more that these innovations are established and proven to work, the more confidence people will have at maybe doing something smarter, embracing the technology and not worrying about it failing, which I think that that is what's holding back uh, people from from embracing innovation. So I think I think we are getting there. And we're getting some good case studies that will build up the more and more people wanting to do something a bit more, a bit smarter, a bit using the, the digital space and and I think that's quite exciting. And I think the, to me, there's the, what you referred to before as I think maturity of systems thinking and how we work together in partnerships and that sort of cultural development side by side with the digital development makes me feel it is possible for us to maybe tackle these things more in a more, more complex way and allow people to have that flexibility to not have to follow one process, but we're all, good minds and we can get behind this but maybe I think reflecting on how we have our own biases as probably engineers most of us um, is quite interesting because I know I have a tendency to come at things from a, a solution focused um, big wanting a big solution that that uh, that meets my needs is probably not always the best best approach but it's where my mind goes to first off I think the enabler there is digital isn't it I mean because yeah. that, that's what's moving faster than any, anything and you combine that with partnerships and all the rest of it and the stuff that's happening in digital now is so exciting that that, that that's really the enabler we just need to trust it more we need to trust it more test it more understand it more and then you know these things hopefully will come together yeah and also make it more accessible i think mm. you know if we are wanting to make sure when appropriate you know where we do want to embrace these organic spaces where you've got more grassroots feeding in we need to make sure that that it's not it's those people are able to access and feed into those digital formats it's not a thing for just the the larger companies that, that can manage and access it's actually available to all and can enable all types of moving forward not just the smarter jazzier <laughs> ones so we, we got five minutes left six minutes left uh we i think we've we've read out all the questions so uh, yeah do do put some questions in if you've uh if you've got any burning questions do let us know and we'll, we'll... or even just points of view you would like to share yeah, <laughs> yeah. i think Any, um anything. I'm sure there's other people that have uh, thought things <clears throat> from from our discussions And the, the other thing I was going to add is if there's anything we've mentioned today that you might want to hear more about or um, uh, access some of the, like the DEFRA report that Brendan was, was mentioning, do do get in touch. Um, I think uh, we have our email addresses on our profiles and things like that. And we'll be happy to follow up with, um, with any inquiries or, or discussions you want to carry on. Yeah, just put your put your name and details in, in the chat and we'll we'll try and get back to you as well if uh if we don't have time today. And there's a question there from, from Kate Lawrence that we might be able to quickly uh, well oh, take yeah. a view on. DEFRA's twenty-five year environmental pl plan concept of 
Picasso. The impact is great, catchment management, uh, catchment planning and management, integrating flood defence, ag agriculture subsidy policy, abstraction and discharges. But who leads it and how is it funded? And I think this is um, one of the, the things that I was trying to say earlier is most of these projects need to be led by one driver and maybe predominantly funded by one driver with partnerships coming in secondary to that would would be where I think we are at the moment. Um, anyone else got a response to that? Yeah, I mean, that's sort of what I was getting at in terms of governance and a bit later on. But I think a lot more needs to be thought about up front before we make those decisions. So, you know, it's quite easy to say, right, this organisation, it sort of fits in there, they lead it. I think it's that's what the systems thinking does basically it maps out all those 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 actors if you like and then have a real discussion on who who would lead it so you know, it, it might have a flood risk benefit but actually a lot of the work is is within uh, sort of a social space then sh should it be the environment agency leading it who, who should it be that, that needs really thinking about because getting that right at the front end is actually really important so i don't have an answer for it but it's it's more just a lot more discussion on it up front and that's why i was saying about the management case often business cases it's just a, a you know, it's, it's a part of it it's really important but it's just sort of overlooked and let's really think about who is owning it who who leads it who's going to have the passion behind them who's going to be yeah who's going to have the powerful voices to get this through and they're the sort of people that should lead these things not necessarily right it's over there it's over there and i think do you think there could be perhaps a disengagement between the, the most appropriate body to lead it and the predominant funder? Because yep. it might be a more appropriate for someone who's not funding it to be the lead, especially if they're the drivers in a collaborative space. Absolutely. And, and maybe uh, that, funders are uh, secondary. That's what I mean. And I, I've worked on projects where, you know, it's led by a certain organisation, but really... Um, and, and the reason for that is because of the funding's there. But really, the benefits are coming out of, of this area, and it's about the right, the right people and the right organisation, and the agileness of that organisation to adapt to it. Instead of just adopting the same old systems, processes, and, and governance structures, we need to look at it at the front. It might take a little bit more time up front, but it will pay itself back hugely. And I think we need to allow that flexibility that each challenge is is looked at again right who are the parties who are the best people and not like right there's a 25 year plan let's have one person driving the whole thing through i don't think that's gonna work yeah. really yeah. it's a classic beneficiary pays surely so uh, surely there's multiple benefits being delivered out of that plan and uh, those benefits should be assigned to uh, yeah, individuals organizations uh, communities and uh, yeah, surely it's either central government funded if it's the communities that benefit or local government. Um, but yeah, beneficiary pays is uh, a good starting point for me. But sometimes that beneficiary could be private. So yeah. which people let's make the contributions. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think a lot of people feel the leadership gets their own bias you know like they're able to drive their, their own needs greater and i think if we are able to bring about this it doesn't matter who leads it we're going to get the best opportunities that, that's possible for for this catchment um then perhaps there could be more of a thought of getting the best person rather than the that's that's where I'd come from of it. You know, if you look at the the IPA and, and what they're looking at at the moment, and, and around the right people, the right, the right competency, the right you know, the right actors in that space. That that's sort of where it needs to go. Instead of just back to the old, yeah, it's here. So this organisation leads it. It's about having the right people. And you might have there might be some a view on forming a, a governmental level. A, a panel of or sponsors that you know take this offline and they decide and then you bring in the, the right people below it so and i think just to close off um kate's point to come back is it takes time and money to map the systems to get that decision on who's the right person Absolutely. and taking yeah. something off the shelf and doing what they've done before is actually easier and gets targets met quicker so i can see the appeal on that i can certainly agree with that 
Okay, it's one o'clock, so um, thanks all for attending. It's been really good. We've had some really good chat. Uh, like Fiona says, if you do have any other questions for us, put it in the chat or contact us directly. And uh, we hope you have a really good rest of the conference. And uh, yeah, thanks for attending. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.